Okay, well, we can definitely start going over the ground rules. So uh, we do have both uh, the chat enabled and the Q&A enabled. So if you would like to ask questions, which we will hold until the end of each talk, then please ask those questions in the Q&A. Um, you're free to use the chat, but uh, please do so respectfully of the, of the speakers and the other participants. Um, if you would like to unmute and ask your question yourself following the talks, then uh, please um, ask them with your name. Uh, or if you would just like me to ask the questions following the talks, then please ask them as a uh, anonymous question. Uh, just as a reminder, the talks are 15 plus five minutes. And I'm gonna be very strict about that. Uh, so please speakers try to stay on time. All right, uh, so thank you everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Luke Kelly. I'm chair of the Astrophysics Working Group in Nanograv. We've got some excellent speakers lined up. Uh, first of all, Nihon Pohl, who will be telling us about the search for anisotropic nanohertz gravitational wave background in the Nanograv 15-year data set. Now please take it away, Nihon. Thanks, Luke. Okay, so I'm hoping this is coming through all right. And if not, just shout at me. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Nihan. I'm a, I'm a postdoc at Vanderbilt. Um, and today I'll be giving a talk about the search for an isotropy in the gravitational wave background with the Nanograph 15 year data set. And I'm giving this talk on behalf of the entire ana analysis team, as well as the rest of the Nanograph collaboration. So I'm sure you've seen this, um, I'm sure you've seen the, these results by now. And um, Sarah gave an excellent talk on Monday showing um, all of these results in great detail. But a few weeks ago now, um, all of the PTAs around the world reported evidence um, for the presence of an isotropic gravitational wave um, background. Um, and the keyword here is isotropic, by which we are making the assumption that the background is the same no matter which direction you look in the sky. And um, while different PTAs reported different levels of significance, Nanograv reported the presence of this gravitational wave background at a level of about three to four sigma. However, this is a, this is a simplifying assumption and it might not necessarily be true. Um, so for instance, if the gravitational wave background is being produced by an astrophysical source like in spiraling supermassive black hole binaries, then we would expect the gravitational wave background to be anisotropic. So it would be different in different parts of the sky. So for instance, if we have an overdensity of the systems in one part of the sky, say in a galaxy cluster, um, then we might see a hotspot as shown in this um, illustration on the top right. Or if we have a few nearby loud um, individual supermassive black hole binary sources, then they might stand up above the overall gravitation wave background and might um, show up as shown in this map on the bottom right. And these two kinds of signatures also have their own unique um, signature if you try to search for these signals um, in the um, spherical harmonic basis, which is shown in the plot on the bottom left. So for a hotspot, um, you would see um, excess power at low spherical harmonic multiples. Whereas for a realistic binary population where you have individual sources standing out above the background, you would see a wide spectrum um, in, the, in the angular power spectrum shown in the bottom left. So really searching for an isotropy can be a really important tool when we are trying to distinguish um, the source of the, of the gravitational wave background between astrophysical systems like supermassive black hole binaries versus cosmological sources like cosmic strings, which are not expected to produce anisotropies at the level expected from supermassive black hole binaries. So this can be a very important tool to um, determine what the source of the background is, as well as to um, um, search for multiple backgrounds that might be present by using this um, different expected anisotropic signature between cosmological and astrophysical sources. So the thing to keep in mind when we search for an isotropy is that um, our null hypothesis in this case is going to be an isotropic gravitation wave background. So we are not as much concerned with um, whether the signal is significant with respect to noise, but rather, can we describe the signal better as an anisotropic gravitation wave background versus an isotropic gravitation wave background? So all of the base factors that I will quote um, here on out um, will be referencing the fact that we are looking for the preference of an anisotropic model over an isotropic gravitation wave background model. All right, so let's take a quick look at the methods that we used in this analysis. So all of the work that we did essentially boils down to this one equation shown on the slide. 
So on the left hand side, we have a matrix that consists of the correlations between the pulsars in any given pulsar timing array. Um, and so you can either include both the auto and cross correlations or just look at the cross correlations. So these um, cross correlations or the overlap reduction function can be written as the matrix product of the F matrix, which is a product of, uh, which is a matrix of product of antenna response functions for, for the pairs of pulsars in your pulsar timing array. And you essentially know this matrix once you know what the configuration of your pulsar timing array is. And so all that's left on the right hand side of this equation is the distribution of the back of the gravitational wave background power. So we measure the overlap reduction function from the data. We know what the F matrix is. And so we need to solve for the gravitational wave background power. So as I said, for the correlations, you can consider both the auto plus, plus the cross correlations in the data set. And so to do this, we use the full PTA Bayesian analysis pipeline. However, these analyses are just so slow and time consuming that it really is difficult to do a whole set of analyses using the full uh, PTA Bayesian pipeline. So um, to perform um, more rapid inferences for um, an isotropy in this data set, as well as to inform some of the Bayesian analyses that we do, we also looked at um, analyses that use just the cross correlation data. And these cross correlations were calculated using the optimal statistic framework um, that is part of the nanograph pipeline. So these, um, these results can be turned around within a couple of weeks, whereas on the other hand, the full PTA Bayesian analysis can take on the order of those few weeks just to burn in and collect enough samples in the MCMC chains. And finally, on the right-hand side, um, for describing the gravitational wave background power, we use two commonly used bases, um, which are the spherical harmonic bases and the radiometer pixel bases. So the radiometer pixel basis it divides the sky up into individual pixels and then um, poses the condition that the entire background is described by power coming from these individual pixels. So this basis is ideally suited for detecting pixel scale features in the gravitation wave background, while the spherical harmonic basis starts from the whole sky and then works inwards towards uh, smaller and smaller angular scales. So this basis is more uh, is better suited for detecting larger angular features in the gravitational wave background. Um, in the gravitational wave background, however, both of these bases do not do not intrinsically restrict the gravitational wave background power to be positive across all sky. And so to work around that, we also um, use the square root spherical harmonic basis. So in this basis, what we do is rather than modeling the power of the background itself, we model the square root of the power. And so that intrinsically forces the power to be positive across all sky. And so all of the results that I present from here on out with the spherical harmonic basis will be using the square root spherical harmonic basis, unless I explicitly say otherwise. All right, so before we jump into the results, a few hyperparameter choices um, that we had to make, just because these analyses can be extensive and are very computationally expensive, um, we had to tone down on the um, number of analyses that we could do with um, as part of this project. So what we did um, to begin with is that we focused all of our analyses on the lowest five frequency bins in our detector. And this is because we found um, the highest level of um, evidence for the presence of correlations in the lowest five bins. So that's where we focused all of our attention. For the spectral indices, for the frequentist analyses, we focused on spectral indices of 13 thirds, which is the canonical expected spectral index. Um, for a population of inspiring supermassive black hole binaries. And we also looked at a spectral index of 3.2, which is what the data preferred in the nanograph 15 year data set. For the Bayesian analyses, um, we again looked at a fixed 13 thirds spectral index. Um, and we also looked at a model where the spectral index was allowed to vary. Um, and finally, we pixelized the sky with an n side equals eight heat pix um, map. So that gives us about a seven, well, exactly 768 pixels. And the figure on the right-hand side is showing the normalized directional sensitivity um, that the nanograph 15-year data set has for an isotropy in the gravitation wave background. And so as you would expect, in the part of the sky where we have the highest density of pulsars, that's where we have the highest sensitivity for any presence of an isotropy, whereas the opposite hemisphere where we have a lower density of pulsars, we are relatively less sensitive to the presence of any anisotropy. All right, so let's first take a look at the radiometer pixel basis. And so here on the bottom left, I'm showing the amplitude um, recovered for um, 
the radiometer pixel basis using our Bayesian PDA pipeline. And on the right hand side, I'm showing the amplitude map um, derived using our frequentist analyses. Um, and the map on the bottom right shows the p-value corresponding to each of the pixels um, in, the, in the map on the top right. And so while we see broad similarities between the, the results from the Bayesian and frequentist analyses, um, what we find is that we really don't have any significant, ev significant evidence for the presence of anisotropy in this data set, implying that um, the current data set um, is best described by an isotropic model for the gravitation wave background. Moving on to the spherical harmonic basis, um, here we, we have to introduce another hyperparameter, which is the choice of L max, which sets um, how many of these spherical harmonic uh, components we use to model the gravitation wave background power. So this is a proxy for um, the, the resolution that we're able to search with in the spherical harmonic basis. So rather than picking an arbitrary number, we wanted to let the data decide what the best value of L max would be. And so to do that, in the plot in the bottom left, I'm showing uh, the evolution of the signal to noise as a function of different values of L max. And so the key thing to look at here is the um, anisotropic signal to noise, which shows, which is representative of the likelihood ratio between an anisotropic model and an isotropic model for describing uh, the data. And so what we found is that the anisotropic signal to noise ratio begins to saturate at an L max of about six. So that's the um, fiducial value that we chose for all of our subsequent analyses in, in this basis. So for that choice of L max equals six, the plot in the top right shows the distribution of the measured signal to noise. Um, and the dotted green line shows the, the null distribution for, um, for the data uh, that was derived using the uncertainties measured from the optimum statistic cross correlations. And so what we find is that the p-value for the mode of the measured signal to noise comes out to a p-value of about 5%. So we really don't have, again, any significant evidence to claim the presence of anisotropy in this data set. And on the plot in the bottom right, I'm showing the measured um, angular power spectrum, along with the decision threshold in that dashed green line, where if we were to measure any angular power that was above these decision thresholds, then that would represent um, tension with the null hypothesis of isotropy. But we don't see that, so we don't really have evidence for anisotropy at any single um, spherical harmonic multiple either. We also do a similar analysis in um, using the Bayesian framework. So here we again using uh, uh, the full set of correlations, so auto plus cross correlations. And again, we find no significant evidence for the presence of anisotropy over isotropy. So these factors are all on the order of one. Um, the plot in the top right shows the upper limit on the deviations away from isotropy. And the plot at the bottom right shows the um, corresponding upper limits on the angular power spectrum that we derived using this pipeline. So the dotted um, line with X's um, shows the upper limits derived from the normal spherical harmonics, while the squares with the dashed line, um, which is a bit hard to see, um, shows the um, upper limits derived using the square root spherical harmonic basis. And so using the square root spherical harmonic basis, we can place upper limits of um, about 20% for the level of anisotropy that might be present in the data set. So, so far, all of the results that I've presented have been using a power law template for the gravitation wave background. However, if this background is indeed coming from supermassive black hole binaries, we know that every frequency will have a different anisotropic signature because we have different supermassive black hole binary systems contributing to different frequency bands. So as a result, we can also do a frequency resolved gravitation wave background um, anisotropy analysis. And um, so some of those results are shown on this slide. Apologies for this slide being so busy. Um, but sort of the takeaway message here is that we found no significant deviations away from the prior um, when using the square root spherical harmonic basis. And so um, this is quantified through the Hellinger distance that's shown on the plot on the bottom left. Whereas um, the two plots on the top right show the, um, again, the deviation away from the monopole. And the plot on the bottom um, shows the um, corresponding upper limits that we set at each frequency for the different spherical harmonic multiples. So to try and tether these results to, to some level of astrophysical expectations for the level of anisotropy, 
What we also did was we used the Holodeck framework, which was developed um, in the astrophysics working group for the Nanograph 15-year astrophysics interpretation paper. Um, and we used it to simulate and evolve supermassive black hole binary populations um, and calculate the parameters for these systems. So you, with these uh, parameters, we then generated skies that had um, a gravitational wave background plus 2,000 of the loudest supermassive black hole binaries from each of these populations that were distributed across the sky using a Poisson distribution. And for each of these skies, we then estimated the angular power spectrum that was expect that that we would expect to have from this um, simulation of a realistic astrophysical um, distribution of supermassive black hole binaries. And so those estimates are shown in this plot on the right-hand side, where the shaded region represents the um, expectations, but represents the one sigma expected range for the level of anisotropy um, coming from the supermassive black hole binary population as a function of gravitational wave frequency. And so what we can see is that the limits that we derive in this work, especially with the square root spherical harmonic basis shown as the dashed lines, we are already at the level where we can begin to probe the, um, the the anisotropy that might be um, present from this population of inspiring supermassive black hole binaries. And so it will be very interesting to see how this evolves as we head into the future with more pulsars and more and a longer timing baseline um, in our PTA datasets and see whether we can pick up any signature of anisotropy in our datasets. And so with that, I'll, I'll leave my conclusions up. Um, this paper is up on the archive um, and you can find it at the, at the archive identifier at the top. Um, and if you're interested in um, hearing more about um, searches for individual supermassive black hole binaries, I would highly recommend um, checking out Ben Sebechi's talk. Um, that's um, Thursday in session 11.3. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Nihan, for a great presentation. Um, I hope people with questions will enter them into the Q&A panel. Uh, something that came to mind for me was I was just wondering if you had kind of any intuition or estimates for how our sensitivity will be improving over time uh, as we move forward. So we looked at how the sensitivity evolves as a, as a function of um, just adding more data um, into our PTA. Uh, so we did this when we when we um, when we developed the method for the square root spherical harmonic basis, and I don't have numbers off the top of my head for you, but um, it it broadly we should yeah I just don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I can I can send them to you later on. Sure, sure, great, thank you. Um, all right, we do have a question. Um, um, just for uh, brevity, I'm gonna ask this one. So to clarify, the L max values you quote here are the L max for the square root Ls or the regular expansion? For both of them. Both of them, okay. Great, any other questions? All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Nihan. Uh, and William, do you wanna try uh, sharing your screen? So next up, we have William Lamb, uh, who will be telling us about Astro vs. Cosmo, interpreting a nanohertz gravitational wave background detection with pulsar timing arrays. Your slide looks great, so go ahead and take it away. I do. You hear me okay? Yep. Great. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is William Lamb. I'm a fourth year uh, rising uh, PhD candidate at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm advised by Dr. Stephen Taylor. And in this pre presentation, I'll discuss interpreting a nanohertz gravitational wave background detection with pulsar timing rays, or as I like to call it, the astro or the cosmo. So you've probably seen this by now. Uh, we have very strong evidence for the gravitational wave background, not just one, not just two, but in four different pulsar timing arrays, which is very exciting. Uh, but this is leading to a lot of speculation now on what the source of that background signal is. Uh, there are two families of uh, sources for the gravitational wave background. First is astrophysical, specifically from supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, so different galaxies will merge over time and the black holes at the centers of those will form a binary and in spiral 
due to gravitational wave emission, creating this background at nanohertz frequencies. Uh, it would be really exciting to be able to detect uh, gravitational wave background from an, this source because we cannot directly observe at the moment uh, binaries at the centers of galaxies. Uh, so we want to learn more about uh, the interactions of binaries with a certain binary S disk um, and the rest of the galaxy. Uh, from this, we can start constraining some more astrophysical parameters, learn more about galaxy evolution, uh, and measure some of the subparsec interactions uh, between the two black holes in the binary. And then there's the cosmological signals. Uh, these are from the early universe. Right now, well, electromagnetically, you cannot detect anything from uh, before 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But gravitational waves is a messenger that could uh, come to us from the early universe. So this would be a very exciting source to be able to directly detect. Uh, and some of the gravitational wave background sources from cosmological sources uh, include rather gravitational waves from inflation, uh, cosmological phase transitions where uh, the universe transitions from a false to a true vacuum, cosmic strings, which are a result from those phase transitions, and many more models. So we need to determine the source of the background. How do we do this? Uh, First of all, you have anisotropy. Uh, Nihan just gave a great talk about this. Uh, in case you missed it, cosmological source will give an isotropic background. An astrophysical source will give an anisotropic background. Uh, but we could also use spectral characterization. What is spectral characterization? We fit uh, our chosen gravitational wave background model spectrum to our data. Uh, and during that fitting process, we would cover a posterior on the parameters that make up that model. So I show that on the right with the nanogram 15 year data set. Uh, in the top right panel, we have a Bayesian periodogram representation uh, in as a gray violin of the gravitational wave background signal, uh, parameterized uh, as this excess timing delay, this RMS timing delay as a function of frequency. Uh, for a very basic astrophysical uh, supermassive black hole binary population that in spiraling only because of gravitational wave emission, you would expect a power law with a spectral index of 13 thirds, which is shown by these dashed black lines. Uh, and we could fit a power law, uh, which we show in blue. And as you can see, there is a small deviation away from this spectral index of 13 thirds. Um, we also see this in the bottom with this posterior of the most of the values of the amplitude and spectral index that is preferred by the 15 year data set. So this suggests that there's something more complicated going on uh, if the background is from an astrophysical source. So we could, this was done by uh, the, astro, uh, the astrophysics working group. Uh, they tried to simulate various uh, populations of supermassive black holes that interacted with uh, their host galaxies and see what kind of uh, background spectra that they would get out. Uh, these were these are called phenomenological models, and you can see this as the uh, blue and orange spectra. And as you can see, compared to the Bayesian periodograms of the signal from the 15-year data set, they fit the data set really, really well, uh, by eye anyway. Uh, compare that to the purple spectra, which is where the black holes are evolving only because of gravitational wave emission. They don't interact with their galaxies. Uh, this isn't as good of a fit. So just from spectra characterization, just visually, uh, we can see that this, if this source is astrophysical, there are some interactions going on between the black hole binary and uh, its host galaxy. So on the left, I show, just for illustrative purposes, the type of posteriors that you would get on each of the parameters that make up your models uh, when you fit your models to the data set. But on the right is some of the astrophysics you can start doing from these posteriors. Uh, so the gray violins show the dis 
distribution of the total masses of the binaries from these simulations uh, in, e in each frequency bin that they were emitting gravitational waves. And in blue is the dis distribution of those binaries that were preferred by the nanograph uh, data set. So from, if this signal is true, what we can conclude from this is that the background is predominantly being formed by high mass binaries, uh, particularly at separations of 0.01 to 0.1 parsecs. So we can start learning something about the background and uh, the supermassive black hole binaries that may be forming it, which is really fascinating. This of course is assuming that the source of the background is astrophysical. But um, what if we want to compare that to cosmological sources? Can we distinguish using spectral characterization uh, whether the uh, background is astrophysical or cosmological? Uh, by eye, this doesn't look particularly obvious because a lot of these spectra uh, of the background from these different sources look very similar, which I show in this plot over here. So in blue, we have this typical power law that, we're, uh, plot, uh, that we search for from sim simple supermassive black hole binary model. Uh, in orange, we have a, an analytical approximation of uh, these interacting binaries, binaries interacting with the galaxy. Uh, and then we have three other cosmological models as cosmic strings, inflationary gravitational waves, and phase transitions. Uh, and they all look very similar. So can our data distinguish between them? So this is a preliminary analysis that I've done uh, using my code Keffel, which allows you to fit spectra really, really quickly. Uh, and this allows us to start using some nested sampling techniques such as ultranets. Uh, so you can start getting base factors between models. So what I did was take the 15 year data set uh, take the signs of arrivals and some of its noise properties and create a simulation based on them and inject gravitational wave background from sound waves that you'd get from a phase transition. Uh, I call this PT sound, and this injection is shown by the dashed black line. I then run this free spectral model, which is our Bayesian periodogram shown in blue, uh, show the distribution of uh, possible a uh, characteristic strain that the data set uh, supports, and then try and fit various models, specifically power law turnover and this PT sound model to those periodograms. And I can do this really, really quickly. Uh, the great thing about using Ultraness is that uh, you get Bayesian evidences, so you can start calculating base factors between these different models. So what are the base factors? Uh, because I injected a PT sound model, I would really hope that the PT sound model is uh, preferred over other models. And this is what I get. Uh, PT sound model is preferred over a power law with a base factor of 2.33. And against a turnover, the PT sound model is preferred with a base factor of 3.08, uh, which is great. Is, uh, this shows that the 15 year data set using spectral characterization, we might start to be able to prefer different models against each other. Of course, these base factors are very small. We need something significantly larger to make um, more decisive conclusions from. Uh, and this is just one analysis, uh, preliminary analysis that I need to do uh, against a whole set of other analyses where I compare the number of frequencies, the time span of the data set, how if we add more pulsars, um, there are a lot of different uh, properties that I can change in the PTA to see how uh, these base factors will evolve over time. Finally, can we distinguish between multiple backgrounds? Say that you have uh, two backgrounds that are overlapping each other from different sources and they have similar powers. Can we be able to distinguish between them using spectral characterization? So to be able to test this, what I've done is I simulated a data set with a 10 frequency power law gravitation wave background, just the one background uh, with a spectral index of 
4.2 almost, and amplitude minus 14.7. I then attempt to fit two power laws using my refit code Kefl. Uh, the first power law is fixed in every analysis I run. Uh, it's power law with the same spectral index as was injected into uh, the data set. The second power law is then fixed in each analysis, but in each analysis, the fixed value is changed uh, to somewhere between zero and seven. So say the first analysis, the second power law has a spectral index of zero, so it's flat. Second analysis has a spectral index of one and so on. So uh, I then attempt to uh, recover an amplitude for both of those spectra. Um, so if we can uh, distinguish between those two uh, spectra, that would mean that the first spectrum with the uh, spectral index uh, that is the same as the injected background uh, should recover an amplitude that is about the same as the amplitude that I injected it as well. Uh, and then the secondary power law should be allowed to vary uh, across all amplitudes below the amplitude that I injected. And I do see this for the majority of the spectral index prior space. Uh, so this shows the recovered amplitude for both uh, power laws that I'm fitting compared to the spectral index uh, of each analysis of the secondary power law. So for the spectral, when the spectral index of that second power uh, of the second power law is different to that first one, the uh, recovered region of the amplitude is quite broad. And the recovered primary amplitude uh, is very similar to the uh, injected amplitude, which is what you would expect. So this means in these regions, if there was a additional uh, background in this simulation, we'd probably be able to find it in those regions uh, if that secondary background had uh, either a very small spectral index or a very large spectral index. But in the center here between spectral index of three and five, uh, the two power laws are actually very similar to each other. So the sampler cannot distinguish between the two. There's confusion between the two of them, which suggests that if we have two power laws, uh, if we have two backgrounds with very similar spectra, uh, we would probably not be able to distinguish between them. Now, I want to see how uh, this region uh, evolves as you increase the time span again of data set, the number of pulsars, the number of frequencies that you're fitting against. Uh, so to be able to uh, figure out what this prior space is that we can start distinguishing between these multiple backgrounds using spectral characterization. So in summary, uh, we can begin to constrain gravitational wave background model parameters and start making that some astrophysical inferences as was shown by the nanograph uh, astrophysical interpretation paper. Spectral characterization will be able to help us determine the source of the gravitational wave background uh, alongside detecting isotropy versus anis anisotropy. And spectral characterization could be able to distinguish between combined astrophysical and cosmological model. And the next steps for my research will be to determine when uh, different sources can be distinguished uh, as a function of time span, number of frequencies, timing uncertainty, number of pulsars, and so on. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, William. Uh, so we have uh, one question in the Q&A chat already, um, which is, uh, this is really interesting. I was wondering if you used a broken power law to account for the white noise floor. Uh, in which model now, uh, which analysis? So uh, for a lot of uh, analyses that we've run, uh, using spectral characterization um, on full data set. Yes, we have used broken power laws. This is how we figure out like an optimal number of frequencies. Uh, so the frequency where the 
uh, power law breaks into to like a flower, uh, flatter spectrum, uh, at that frequency, we tend to cut it off right there. I actually had a related question, um, which is that there's there's been a lot of talk about how sensitive analyses are to different types of noise modeling, uh, and uh, the free spectrum fits can can vary kind of noticeably from those different assumptions. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on ways of kind of testing that sensitivity or taking that into account in your analysis? So, in these uh, simulations, I've kept them really simple uh, using like a constant white noise, just injecting um, the maximum likelihood uh, red noise parameters for each of the pulsars. Uh, but in future, it'll be really interesting to start looking at like how uh, different, if, if we simulate between like DMX and DMGP models for dispersion measure, um, how different uh, white noise uh, injections will affect spectral characterization uh, is something I would be interested in looking into in the future. But yeah, they certainly make a difference. And if you mismodel them, uh, you will get different uh, re results in your analyses. Gotcha. Thanks, William. Uh, and we have one more question from uh, Swinburne. Um, you can go ahead and uh, unmute and ask the question. Swinburne? Yeah, I was, I was just curious, it's Ryan Shannon here. A very nice talk. I was curious about how much the analysis you think is really latching on to like the common red, red noise part of the background versus the angularly correlated signal. This kind of goes kind of to what Luke was just, just discussing. Yeah, so uh, what I do with a lot of these analyses is run a free spectrum analysis and then fit onto the free spectrum itself. Um, so it depends on how well that free spectrum is able to uh, separate itself out from intrinsic red noise. But as I'm moving on with a lot of these analyses, um, I'm comparing uh, common red noise free spectrum analysis versus Hellings and Downs free spectrum analysis. Uh, so I think that would be able to show how much uh, how, how much we can distinguish between the intrinsic red noise and uh, the gravitational wave background itself. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'd be curious to get a Hellings and Downs thing that was just the angularly correlated bit, but maybe maybe that's already accounted for. Thanks. Great, all right, thank you so much, William. Uh, I think we should move on to our next speaker, uh, Alexander, if you could go ahead and share your screen. So next up, we have Alexander Criswell, who uh, will be speaking about simultaneous inference of multiple stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds and foregrounds in LISA. Go ahead, Alexander. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm Alexander Criswell. I'm a PhD student at the University of Minnesota working with Luke Mendich and these wonderful folks here. Uh, and I, I will be getting further into this idea of spectral separation, but instead of looking at the uh, the potential gravitational wave background in nanograv, we're going to be looking at LISA. Uh, if I can advance my slides, there we go. Uh, if anyone is unfamiliar, LISA is a space-borne gravitational wave detector that's going to launch in the mid-2030s. And the primary analysis problem that we really want to be worrying about or thinking about when it comes to LISA is going to be the fact that LISA, instead of having you know, individual chirps like we see with modern uh, ground-based detectors or with a single stochastic background or potentially more than one stochastic background as we're, we're currently seeing in Nanograv uh, and IPTA broadly. Uh, it's going to have millions of sources in the band all at the same time and we have to try to figure out how to piece them apart. The solution that the field seems to be converging towards is this idea of a global fit to try to statistically, in a Bayesian sense, fit for all of these sources simultaneously. Okay, so I will not be talking about most of the sources that are going to be present in LISA because I will be focusing on specifically the stochastic sources. And this will be probably an incomplete tour. Uh, there are a lot of potential backgrounds in LISA. I'm just highlighting uh, the ones that are particularly relevant for the work I'm showing here. 
Uh, so the first one that we're quite sure is going to be present is going to be a roughly isotropic stochastic background from stellar origin binary black holes, as well as uh, binary neutron stars and neutron star black hole binaries. And these are going to be the same sources that will eventually chirp in the LBK band, but uh, are, are still down at millihertz frequencies, are very far away from, uh, from the point that they would actually merge and are comprising a stochastic background. Uh, there have been some really nice recent predictions, notably by Stas Babak and all, of taking the LVK data and the observations there and projecting those rates out to the isotropic signal that we expect to see in LISA, and it should be observable. The next one that we need to think about is actually going to be uh, different in a couple ways. Uh, one, it is a highly anisotropic signal because it is coming from all of the binary white dwarf systems that are present in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The second way that it's going to be different is it's actually so loud that it sits above the detector noise, often getting termed a foreground instead of a background. This is, uh, the Milky Way is not the only body nearby that has a lot of white dwarf binaries in it. Uh, the Milky Way has a number of dwarf galaxy satellites that contain the white dwarf binaries. And some recent work by, uh, by an undergraduate that I work with, Stephen Reek, has shown that it is likely that the signal and the, the unresolved white dwarf binaries in the Large Magellanic Cloud specifically may be detectable by ELISA, as well as a highly localized anisotropic uh, background. And then there's a bunch more possible. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in detail. You can see the, the papers reference there, but there may be a number of other stochastic backgrounds that we want to try to search for in LISA data. And in order to do that, we are going to have to successfully search for those in the presence of these other, in the presence rather of these other signals which leads us to doing simultaneous inference across multiple different stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds. And this is where we will enter BLIP, BLIP being the Bayesian Lisa inference package. Uh, this is the brainchild of Sharon Banajiri. Um, and for the last two, three years, I've taken over as the lead developer of, of this package. And what we can do with BLIP is we can do end-to-end -end simulation and analysis of stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds in LISA. So we can do full time domain simulations of stochastic gravitational wave signals along with the LISA instrumental noise and any of the usual channels that we use for LISA. We can handle on the analysis side both isotropic and anisotropic analyses. Um, using a uh, method similar to the one that was highlighted in, in the first talk, uh, doing spherical harmonic inference in that square root spherical harmonic basis. Um, and then we use that to do, to do Bayesian inference, right? This is what we're going to focus on. A couple of things that I want to highlight that have been recently added to the code. Uh, one, we have, uh, I have been spending a lot of time recently optimizing the code. These are very, very complicated problems that uh, tend to take a very long time. But recently we've implemented GPU acceleration and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling, which has really sped things up. And the next thing that I want to highlight that will be particularly important for the results that you're going to see is that we've introduced fully modular signal and noise models. So the way that we do that is that we have a, a Fourier domain likelihood. Um, there's the details are there. It's a multi-dimensional complex Gaussian. But the thing that I really want to highlight about this is that the primary component in this likelihood that depends on the model is going to be the covariance. You also have the data here, but the covariance is, has this really nice property in that it is uh, it is linear. So if you have multiple contributions from, for example, instrumental noise or an isotropic uh, background from stellar origin binaries or the galactic white dwarf foreground, the covariance that is induced into LISA from all of these sources adds together linearly. So we just have a total covariance that goes into our model that is a sum of multiple constituent uh, covariance, covariances, covariance. Anyway, this is how you would implement that in the, the params file that goes into a blip analysis. We would simply uh, designate some model as a combination of what we call submodels. And so, for example, 
This would be a two parameter position and acceleration noise model in, con uh, in, in conjugation with a isotropic power law model, for example, a stellar origin binary stochastic background. And then a, a model for the galactic foreground that assumes we know the sky distribution, perhaps for measurements of resolved white dwarf binaries, and then models the, uh, the spectrum of the, the white dwarf binaries, the Milky Way, as a power law that cuts off at a, at a certain frequency via hyperbolic tangent truncation. So the thing that I want to really highlight here is that all of these spatial and spectral models are implemented generically. You can mix and match as much as you want. Uh, and in principle, you can add together as many of these as you want, and the code allows for it. Uh, I have to caveat here, right? You are always going to be subject to computational and statistical limitations. Um, but if your cluster can handle it and your data can actually support the inference that you're trying to do, we can put together any sort of flexible model that, that we care to. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to start showing you some pretty pictures, some, uh, some result slides. I want to make a note about the noise first so they don't have to say this on every slide. For all of the simulations and analyses that I show you here, um, we will be assuming the position acceleration noise as uh, stated in the LISA proposal um, using their spectral form. And then when we infer the noise levels, we will leave the, the amplitudes of the position acceleration noise in LISA as free parameters. And again, we will, we will, uh, uh, infer those within the context of the, the spectral form expected for, um, for the LISA detector. Okay, so let's start very, very simple, right? We're not going to do anything terribly complicated to begin with. Uh, we are going to look for an isotropic background in the presence of detector noise. And what you're seeing here is uh, four years of simulated data, so the nominal LISA mission lifetime. Uh, and we have simulated a isotropic background that is uh, that is what would be expected um, based on the median realization of that very nice paper by Stas Babak and company of the stellar origin binaries. And then we just model this, assuming uh, we model the least of noise, and then we model an isotropic power loss stochastic background. So we infer both the amplitude and the slope of the signal. And as you can see, as expected, with four years of data, we're able to do this very nicely. Now let's start looking at the foreground. Uh, we're going to start with a very simplified version of the foreground so that we can really nail down our model to actually what is in the data and then later on, we can start to break that assumption, right? So this is going to be an analytic model of both the galaxy spectrum and the spatial distribution of the galaxy. And then we are going to assume, again, we know a priori that fixed galaxy spatial, spatial distribution, and then uh, model the spectrum of the truncated power law. As you can see, we fit it almost perfectly, and the error bars here are, are in fact so small that they don't show up well on the plot, um, but they, they are there. But that's not the real situation we're going to be dealing with when Lisa flies. Instead, we are going to have a population of white dwarf binaries uh, that all give rise to this foreground together, maybe embedding features in it, and making a, a foreground that is not a nice analytic spectrum, but is instead uh, something that looks a fair bit more like this. Uh, what we've done here is we've used a, a population synthesis catalog um, created by Valeria Coral and company. And um, we've removed all of the uh, binaries that we assume to be individually resolvable with Lisa, so we, anything above an SNR of seven. And then we try to uh, recover both the spectral distribution that you see here, as well as the, the spatial distribution of um, of this population with a broken power law spectral model and then a, a generic and flexible spherical harmonic model, very similar to the one that was that was highlighted in the first talk. Um, okay, now let's do what I actually promised in the title of the slide with the four minutes that I have left, which is doing simultaneous inference of multiple stochastic signals within Lisa. So this is going to be a simulation for one year of data, looking at, uh, again, that simplified model galaxy and a particularly loud isotropic power law uh, stochastic background. And then we're going to try to recover that, again, assuming that we know the distribution of the galaxy 
And with the same spectral model as we have analytically uh, ejected into the simulation, along with just that, that standard isotropic power law model that we saw earlier. And as you can see, we are again able to simultaneously infer all of these things. Now, obviously, there are places to go from here. Uh, one, we need to actually be doing this at the full uh, full mission duration. What we see here is for one year of data and for a fairly loud um, background that is louder than we expect for the stellar origin black hole binaries. We need to simulate the full uh, least, least nominal mission duration and maybe the extended duration of 10 years. That's currently cooking. Uh, these simulations are fairly complicated and computationally intensive, so it did not get done uh, by the time uh, of this talk. But so it goes, keep an eye out. The next thing that is going to actually be really important is inferring a realistic foreground alongside um, the isotropic background from, for example, again, solar origin binaries, because our model, no matter what our spectral model is, is not going to perfectly fit the actual astrophysical foreground. So we need to understand how the differences between our fit and reality are going to impact our ability to infer the background behind it. Related to this is some great ongoing work by Sean Banagiri and his RU student, Wendy Zeng, to introduce a non-parametric spectral fit into BLIP, not assuming a functional form, but allowing uh, the data really to change our, our spectral form of the fit. You can go further than this. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there are a number of different potential stochastic backgrounds and signals that we will have the potential to see in LISA. Can we infer multiple deployed dwarf populations? We can make this sort of spectral separation because the highly anisotropic nature of the galactic foreground makes it interact differently with the detector than an isotropic signal like the stellar origin binaries. But what if you have two anisotropic signals? Can we use the intense localization of the large Magellanic cloud to separate out the contribution from the Milky Way and the large Magellanic cloud, even though these spectra, these populations spectrally share more or less the same frequency space? And how far can we go? Can we keep adding stochastic backgrounds and inferring them? Where does that break down? If we have uh, multiple uh, isotropic backgrounds, can we fit to all of those, even though the detector response will be the same because of differences in their spectral distribution? Uh, we don't know yet. We have to figure this out over the next 10 or so years before LISA launches and looking forward to doing it. Uh, some brief uh, acknowledgments, and then as we move to questions, I will leave my uh, my summary slide up here, and I'm happy to to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, Alexander. Uh, so please enter any questions you have into the Q and A. So something that I was wondering about, uh, you commented on, you know, wondering about imperfect modeling of foreground sources, um, but I was wondering about. Uh, why is your framework blip? Why is it limited to backgrounds? Is it just because of the the Fourier basis? Uh, would you need to move to time domain or wavelets, or is there more to it? Yeah, so I, I guess really the fundamental reason for that is we've built it to do stochastic analyses, right? Um, our, our likelihood is based assuming that all of our signals are coming in in the form of correlated noise and the detector integrated over a long period of time. Uh, however, there's, there's no reason that we can't integrate something like this uh, with other, other search uh, pipelines and other search methods that are more tuned towards individual sources that we will see in LISA. And in fact, we are actually uh, beginning work collaborating with, um, with the folks that are putting together uh, the global fit to include a blip or an adaptation of blips underlying mechanisms as part of the, the overall wheel of the, the global fit. Cool, thank you. I've got another one actually, and this one's probably extremely simple. Uh, in your recovery of the isotropic background, um, you showed that the signal was like three orders of magnitude below your, your instrument noise. Mm -hmm. um, is that just based on, on integration time that you're able to get down that low? So, so we have two advantages. Uh, when it, 
When it comes to when it comes to isotropic backgrounds, we, we are limited to only two advantages. Uh, but fundamentally, because of how we have constructed um, time domain interferometry, the specific combinations of the different arms of LISA, gravitational waves will interact differently with the uh, with the detector than the instrumental noise does. Now, I, I will note that in these simulations, we are not making the assumption that is sometimes made that uh, one of those TDI channels will be a completely null channel that is only sensitive to instrumental noise. We actually model it all the way through, um, and that is an assumption that is not quite true. So we avoid it and instead just fully simulate how the noise interacts with the different channels and how the signal interacts with the, the different channels. And the fact that those interactions are different gives us some additional constraining power. But beyond that, yes, it's integration time. That's one of the reasons um, that I make the comment here that actually like when I run for one year of data, the realistic median uh, stellar origin binary background, we only can place upper limits after a year. We just need more integration time. Okay, got it. Thank you. Very clear. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much again, Alexander. Thank Very you. nice presentation. All right. So I was a little bit too excited to hear the next talks, but now after a nice break, we're all freshened up. Um, our next speaker up is Daniel Reardon, who will be telling us about search for stochastic gravitational wave background with the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array. Go ahead and take it away, Daniel. Okay, thanks. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm talking about our um, recent search for nanohertz frequency gravitational waves with the third data release of the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array. The paper is there if you uh, want to check it out. So I'll just blast over some introduction. Um, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array has been operating since 2004 and uh, is currently observing about 37 millisecond pulsars. Um, in the third data release, we used 30 pulsars and our data span was up to 18 years. So these millisecond pulsars, the best of them can be timed to less than 100 nanoseconds in RMS residual. And the uh, noise in the timing residuals includes lots of uh, effects, which Andrew Zick talked about if you went to his talk. Um, there's intrinsic pulsar spin noise, the interstellar medium, solar wind, pulsar magnetic spheric events. Um, we measure and model all of these things um, and take them into account simultaneously with our uh, gravitational wave background search. And the philosophy in the PPTA analysis was really to try to understand these noise processes as well as we could um, before searching for gravitational waves. So there's lots of sources for these potential gravitational waves. Um, I list them here. Uh, probably the most conservative source that I'll focus on is the supermassive black hole binaries. We expect the uh, stochastic background to be isotropic and to induce steep red timing residuals which have a uh, spectral index of um, 13 thirds. And the expected strain from these uh, supermassive black hole binaries is, should be of the order 10 to the minus 15. So in the data, um, this is what a gravitational wave would look like in simulation. So on the left is a pulsar timing array with the low frequency uh, wiggles in the timing residuals seen for multiple pulsars. When you take the power spectrum, you see that there's this uh, excess noise at low frequencies. And uh, yeah, the slope of this spectrum should be uh, close to 13 thirds. But really the signature of the gravitational waves is this uh, spatial correlation pattern. This is how we separate gravitational waves from say intrinsic spin noise in the pulsar, which just happens to have a similar spectral index. So yeah, this uh, spatial correlation pattern is what we're looking for. So when we measure the achromatic noise um, in the pulsars in the PPTA, so uh, we take the, what well, basically measure the amplitude and slope of that, that power spectrum I showed on the previous slide. Um, we plot here the one, the one sigma uh, confidence intervals for the amplitude on the y-axis and the spectral index on the x-axis. So, there's um, quite a bit of variation among our population of pulsars. 
we see that 1824 up here in purple is very loud and, and steep spectrum noise. It seems to be different from all the other pulsars. There's another pulsar here, 1643, which has very shallow uh, spectrum noise and it's also quite loud. But there is this clustering of uh, these um, one sigma posterior distributions. And it's this clustering that defines what we will be measuring as a common spectrum process when we search for um, such a thing in our, our whole array. Um, Andrew Zick already mentioned this in his talk, but this black line is the 90% confidence interval for 1713. It's a pulsar that seems to have very strange noise properties in our data set um, in the context of all the other pulsars. Uh, it's very um, shallow spectrum and, and weak red noise. Um, so it seems to be a little bit different. But because of that clustering, um, we can recover a common spectrum process. Here I'm showing a factorized likelihood analysis where we fix the spectral index at 13 thirds, just because it's, it's close to what we measure with the, the full um, array. And it's also testing a specific model. So we fix the spectral index at 13 thirds for this supermassive black hole binaries. And then for each pulsar, we uh, determine the posterior probability distribution for the amplitude at that spectral index. So the multiple lines here, the gray lines and the colored lines, these are the posterior distributions on the amplitude for individual pulsars. The colored lines just highlight three individual pulsars. They are, they are each. Um, that, sorry, they, they highlight six individual pulsars. The three with the highest support for common noise at this amplitude and the three with the lowest support. So 1909 is this purple line, which has the um, so the highest posterior probability at the amplitude um, that we measure for the common process. And 1713 is that strange one that I showed, uh, talked about on the previous slide. That's this gray line where the probability density actually drops off and it offers negative support for a common uh, noise process at this amplitude. Uh, yeah, I should say the, the black line is the product of all of these, which is our, uh, our constraint on the amplitude using the full array. So, um, however, when we use the full array and we let the spectral index vary as well as the amplitude, we find that uh, we recover these uh, posterior distributions. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, on the y-axis is the amplitude, x-axis is the, uh, the spectral index. And the different colors here represent different models of our solar system. The green uh, line, uh, green contours are the constraints from the most up-to-date solar system ephemeris, but they're all uh, roughly consistent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we measure a spectral index, which is a little shallower than 13 thirds, but it's definitely still consistent with that. Um, if we were to fix the spectral index at 13 thirds, then our data is, um, is consistent with that. We don't recover any ex excess noise. So these are the numbers. Um, yeah, the spectral index is about 3.9 uh, at an amplitude of um, 13 thirds. It corresponds to a strain uh, spectrum amplitude of two uh, times 10 to the minus 15. So it's about what was expected for supermassive black hole binaries. If we let the power in individual Fourier um, components of our model vary. Uh, we find that um, it there's lots of significant Fourier frequencies contributing to this signal. Um, and uh, it's also it seems to be consistent with a, a power law. So one interesting analysis that we did as part of our work was to look at how the signal seems to be changing with time. So this is motivated by the fact that a previous um, PPTA limit uh, was placed at 95% confidence at one times 10 to the minus 15, which is um, of course half the amplitude that we're now measuring. Uh, there was also an IPTA detection checklist, which uh, mentioned that uh, this is something that PTAs should investigate uh, and come up with a, a convincing explanation for why uh, a signal might be measured uh, at a greater amplitude than uh, previous limits from the same uh, the same pulsar timing rate. 
So just looking at the bottom panel here, what we've done is taken nine year segments from our 18 year data set. And for each of those nine year segments, we have um, measured just the amplitude of a 13 thirds process. And the violins here are showing the posterior distributions for that. So this first orange violin is showing the constraint from the first half of our data set. The last uh, violin is showing the second half of our data set, the set, uh, last nine years. <clears throat> and the violins in between move this nine year window forward by one year at a time. So what we find is that in the early parts of our data set, uh, we make no detections of common noise and our data is well, consistent with, with white noise for, for a common process. And we can only set upper limits. Um, the 95% confidence upper limits from this first nine year um, window is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15. And this is using the same noise models, the same solar system ephemeris and using all of the pulsars in our array. Um, so we think based on, um, well, based on what we know about these common noise searches that it, it should be um, fairly robust. Um, so that's, that's interesting. And it, it suggests that something might be changing with time. Um, perhaps there's non-stationarity in the signal, but it could very easily be non-stationarity in the pulsars themselves or some kind of model misspecification in the pulsars. Um, but this is something that uh, we should keep in mind for future searches. And I think other PTAs should also uh, look at with their data sets. So when we go to actually search for the spatial correlation pattern, which is the fingerprint of the gravitational waves, um, we find actually that there's no Bayesian evidence for or against this signal in our data set. We get base factors of 1.5 to 2, depending on whether we fix the spectral index or not. Um, so that's not significant. However, this analysis uses the autocorrelations only. Um, and although the PPTA did um, a very detailed analysis of noise properties, it's still a possibility that this is affected by misspecification of individual pulsar noises. And so uh, it's important to try to look at the cross correlations only. And especially because this is also an item in the uh, IPTA detection checklist. So, um, yeah, we, we came up with a new approach to look at the cross correlations only uh, and to revisit this, um, this analysis. So, um, basically, uh, wh what we did is we, uh, instead of looking at the, the full array and try to separate out the cross correlations only, um, we analyzed the um, 435 individual pairs that we could um, we could form from our 30 pulsars. So it's it's like looking at the uh, individual elements of the covariance matrix one at a time. And for each one of those um, pairs, we measure the uh, amplitude and correlation coefficient of a common noise process through that pair. Um, once we had these posterior distributions, which are like shown on, on, the, um, on the left here, we form a smooth um, model using uh, kernel density estimation. And from these, we can pull out measurements of the correlation coefficient at any amplitude that we want. And so we referenced or reweighted them so that all of these pairs assumed the same uh, common noise amplitude, which um, you know is almost equivalent to searching for it in the full array. There are, are various assumptions here, like um, you know, it's assuming all of the pairs are independent, which is not quite true. Um, but I'll show you how we deal with that uh, later on. So with our 435 measurements of the correlation coefficient, we can then define a likelihood of the, um, the Hellings-Downs cross correlations for gravitational waves and compare it to the likelihood of zero. And we do that just by uh, finding the values of the probability through all of those pairs and taking their product. So when we do that, we can place our 435 measurements into angular bins on the sky. Um, so on the x-axis is the separation angle between the pulsars. The gray histogram is showing the number of pairs that uh, land in each of these bins. Um, and this bin binning is just for visualization purposes. We didn't do any binning to form the likelihoods. 
Um, so the violins here are showing the product of the um, posterior distributions for all of the pairs that landed in that bin. And we can see that the PPTA is sensitive to spatial correlations um, because these violins are constrained. And so we can measure correlations at this amplitude. And we ask the question, how do they look? And so we define this likelihood ratio, which is the likelihood of uh, the Hellings and Downs, the probabilities through this black line. And we compare that to the likelihood at zero. So we take a line through zero and product their probabilities. Um, it's almost like a Bayes factor if you were to do this analysis on the full array all at once, but because of the various assumptions that went into this analysis, it's not quite. Um, we call it a just a, the likelihood ratio, and we instead have to interpret its significance with sky scrambles, which from this technique is, is very, very fast. So um, generating 10,000 random positions of the pulsars on the sky, we can ask the question, how often do we see something that looks like this just by chance? And the answer is about 2% of the time. So our um, 11 likelihood ratio or pseudo Bayes factor corresponds to a significance of about 2%. So um, again, this is a little bit stronger than when we looked at the order and cross correlation simultaneously, but it's not uh, evidence for um, gravitational waves on its own. But in the context of the other results from the PTAs, um, it is uh, nevertheless interesting. So yeah, I've already mentioned this technique can enable fast sky scrambling, but um, really it's, it's also fast for searching for anisotropy in the future. And there is a way that we can uh, construct a correlation only constraint on the amplitude of the background. We don't have to assume an amplitude. Um, we didn't get to do that in this analysis, but this is something to look, uh, to look at in the future. <clears throat> so uh, in conclusion, uh, these are the various uh, very beautiful Hellings Downs uh, correlations that you've seen from the, the PTAs. Um, collectively, um, this is the first evidence for nanohertz frequency gravitational waves. Um, I'll just note that the PTAs are not, not independent. We observe many of the same pulsars, so it's perhaps not surprising that they are similar signals. The Park's role in this um, in these results is that uh, we use 30 southern pulsars we have the lowest reported significance, but um, I think we also did the most detailed noise analysis. And our work sort of raises some questions uh, that we should keep in mind for the future. So the amplitude appears to be growing with time and not all of our pulsars seem to be affected by the common noise. Um, and so we look forward to revisiting these questions with the PP PPTA dataset in the global IPTA. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so we already have uh, at least one question popping up, a few questions popping up. So uh, first, are the amplitudes at all of the slices also calculated using the factorized likelihood method? Do they all use the same noise model or do you refit for a noise model for each slice? Uh, yeah, so those amplitudes are not factorized likelihood. They're um, you know, uh, in the full uh, PTA analysis. Um, all at once. Um, we, we do refit the noise models. So uh, every, um, every noise parameter that is present in the full data set is present in those slices, but we resample them. So they're allowed to take on different values. Um, so they're not fixed in that way. Okay, gotcha. And then next question, uh, is the low significance possibly related to overfitting the data with noise models? Uh, it's a possibility. Um, we think that it's not that surprising. We do have fewer pulsars. Um, it, the amplitude seems to be changing with time in our data set, which means that you know the full data set is not perhaps not uh, valuable. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, I mean, it could be overfitting. The, there's perhaps a different of difference in philosophy uh, among the different PTAs. So our philosophy was to first fully understand the noise processes and then treat that as the null model and search for gravitational waves on top of that. Um, uh, it, it could be that the signal would be higher if we took out some of those noise processes because perhaps they're absorbing something. But you know, personally, I think if, if you add 
say scattering noise to your model and the evidence goes down, then that's probably not a good thing. Um, so yeah, may, maybe, but th this is just the philosophy that we went with in this search. Okay. It's an interesting perspective that the full data set might not be valuable. <laughs> Um, so the uh, next question is, um, is the presence of a chirping uh, supermassive black hole binary a possible explanation for the potential non-stationarity of the signal, or do the time scales not work out? Uh, yeah, I can only speculate on that. I've been thinking about it just a little bit, but um, I think if you had some combination of anisotropy and eccentric sources, I think uh, such a thing uh, could be non-stationary in time. Um, I, I'm pretty sure if it's if it's an isotropic background, then the eccentricity doesn't matter. But if you start to have individual sources or a small population of sources, then um, yeah, you could have stranger things happening in the uh, time domain. Interesting. Um, okay, last question. Uh, have you done simulations to show how or if your noise models affect the significance of cross correlations? Um, not, a, not exactly, no. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Andrew Zick's paper was closest on that, which looked at um, sort of misspecification in, um, well, choice of different priors and, and noise models and what well, priors for those noise models and looked at how often uh, spurious correlations happen. And um, yeah, you can definitely make spurious measurements or you know affect the common noise inference, but the correlations seem to um, track well enough with the statistics, so. Gotcha, all right. Well, thanks again so much, Daniel, uh, for a very nice talk and very nice question, answers to some serious questions. <laughs> Um, all right, so next up we have our last talk of the session, which is from Ryan Shannon. Uh, if you could go ahead and share your screen. Hey, uh, so oh, I, I'm excuse actually going to this one. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Combo. All right, from Matt Miles, so go ahead and take it away. Great. Um, can everyone, you can hear me okay, obviously. Uh, uh, so yeah. my name is Matt Miles. I'm a final year PhD student down at Swinburne University, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the MeerCat Boss Timing Array, um, and a bit about its noise budget and the first results that we've managed to extract from it so far. Uh, so a little bit about MeerCat. Um, oh, is it going to move? Is it going to work? Hey, there we go. A little bit about MeerCat. Um, it is the uh, SKA precursor telescope uh, in the Great Karoo region of South Africa. And in terms of a pulsar timing facility, it is truly excellent. Uh, from just the basic uh, arrival times we can observe from it, when we look at it in terms of timing residuals, uh, root mean square uncertainty is into the hundreds of nanoseconds range uh, quite easily for most of our pulsars. And we're able to observe 85 of those pulsars uh, in 12 hours every two weeks. So we have a very, very nice cadence and many pulsars to look at. Uh, and we also look at a very wide range of southern pulsars which is a bit of a deficiency in the PTA landscape at the moment, uh, given the only real uh, PTA that's uh, making an impact in that area is the Parkes Pulse Timing Array. So we're adding a, a huge amount of data um, into the PTA world, which is uh, nice in an IPTA context, as well as nice for the MeerCat Pulse Timing Array on its own. Um, the natural kind of thing to ask at this point is, you know, why is it important for something like the MPTA to come along now? Um, and why is it important generally? Uh, and I would argue that the reason it is, is because we've started to move uh, into what I would call like the strong uh, signal or the detection error of nanohertz frequency gravitational waves and the stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, and what I mean by that is the way the correlator signal is going to become uh, more important to analyze and more dominant. And this error is going to be dominated by the number of pulsars that are routinely observed, uh, which is really where the MPTA can accelerate the PTA community to a definitive detection and beyond, because we can assist in giving much, uh, many, many more pulsars to the RPTA, uh, which are going to be all across the southern sky. Um, so that's really uh, why the MPTA is uh, good for a global point of view, but our data set that we're using at the moment uh, is an extension of a data set that we released uh, about a year and a half ago, which was the 2.5 year data release. If anyone wants to go take my data and use it, please scan that QR code, it's all for you. Uh, but the upgrade is really just in this image on the right there. 
Uh, we've increased the number of pulsars that we're releasing and using in this analysis from 78 to full 85. Uh, we're going from 2.5 years to four years of data. Uh, these are all regularly observed over two weeks. And along the way, uh, about four of them were removed uh, to get this 85 number. Originally, the plan was to use 89, but these ones that I've listed here, while they're astrophysically very interesting, they're very difficult to time to high precision. And so they're not really sensitive to gravitational waves. And that's really the aim of the game. Um, so we have this great data set and we want to do all this analysis on it. Uh, and so I'm going to take a leaf out of uh, Jeff Hasbrun's book here and talk about the dumpster fire in the way of the gravitational waves. Um, or as I would argue is that you have this noise in the data and that's the whole point of a pulse timing array. We were trying to search for this noise in the data. Um, and while that is, you know, stochastic gravitational waves, um, it's really, you've got to be looking through that dumpster fire to get to that pot of gold. But I think I'd also argue that a lot of that dumpster fire could, you could just toss it in the pot of gold and you wouldn't notice there's too much difference. I think there's some really great astrophysical things you can get out of that, um, which is really interesting in its own right. Uh, and so depending on who you ask, you know, noise is either good or really bad, but it's, it's fascinating. And if you ask me, I'll give you both of those answers, depending on how I'm feeling on any day. Uh, but it's really sort of like the um, cool thing that we can do with this data set, given the amount of uh, highly precisely timed millisecond pulses that we have in it. Um, and so how we've decided to do it is a little bit different from other pulse timing arrays. We've decided to do this detailed noise analysis similar to the Parkes pulse timing array, but we've decided to do it in such a way that it's a, a completely hierarchical Bayesian analysis. So we start from the ground floor uh, determining the white noise properties and move all the way up, comparing uh, any co possible combination of uh, noise processes in our data that we can think of. And we do this through the standard enterprise uh, sampling software, but we've introduced uh, a nested sampler into it, which we, for this one, we use Pi Polychord because it's very efficient when you uh, do MPI enabled sampling runs. Uh, so we're really just letting the data inform us uh, of the noise process that it's that it, uh, is able to uh, present us in this data. Um, and so we can get these really nice determinations out, which is what I'm just showing on the right here. So this is uh, the PTA golden child, uh, J1909 minus 3744. Um, and on the top panel, it's just this raw uh, timing residuals. Uh, and then on the bottom, I've just zoomed in a little bit and you can see the uh, determinations of the different noise processes that are found in it. So it's got achromatic noise, uh, it's got solar wind noise, it's got dispersion measure noise, um, and you can see it overlaid on that pattern in the residuals. Uh, so you can really capture everything that's happening uh, in this pulsar in the residuals. Uh, we can get some really uh, interesting sort of insights out, and that's a lot easier to see when we start to sort of average all these observations through frequency. So if I was to take away all those interstellar medium effects, all the chromatic effects, um, which are dependent on radio frequency of the observation, uh, and I just leave in this achromatic noise, then I get this lovely curve on that top panel there. And this curve is incredibly similar to what we expect a gravitational wave signal to be. So this could, just keep that in mind, this could actually just be the gravitational wave. So this, it's fun to be able to sort of model this as accurately as we can and uh, really get a nice insight into what the data looks like. And not just the data, but what the noise processes in the data look like. And then we can get rid of all of that, and we only have a 58 nanosecond scatter on our residuals when we uh, account for it. So we have this very, very precise analysis, very, very precise data, and a really uh, wide range of uh, data products that we can play with. And the reason that we want to do this uh, is really spelled out by this pulsar here. This is a pulsar uh, J1747 minus 4036, which has been reported in other data sets uh, as having achromatic red noise and dispersion measure noise. And in fact, uh, in our previous analysis, we actually reported it as having these two processes. And the reason we did that at the time was we weren't doing a detailed noise analysis. We were looking at just the indicator. We were looking for an indicator of uh, whether it had noise in its data. And so that's what we reported it uh, had at that time. Um, but this is a really good example of how noise misspecification can really go quite wrong. In that top panel, we just have the, it's all the same time span, all the same scale on each panel, but that's just the raw residuals in those top panel. And that's uh, the scatter of the frequency average residuals uh, that are in this pulsar. And then in the middle panel, what I have is the realizations of the uh, dispersion measure noise and the achromatic red noise. And I've taken out the dispersion measure noise from the residuals, and you can just see that there's achromatic red noise tracing along the residuals there. And peak to peak, that is a red noise of 800 nanoseconds. That is a, a massive amount of uh, noise in the data. 
And were you to do something like a common noise search in, uh, in a data for a signal like this, it would definitely strongly affect it. And it would really uh, affect the result that you get and maybe even discount pulsar as something that could be sensitive to a gravitational wave background. But then when we do a detailed noise analysis, we find what we find just down the bottom there, where we have these competing uh, chromatic processes. Um, and they, when, they, when the data informs us that this is what is in it, we can take them both out and we can get this, these widened residuals out. And it is pretty interesting here that they seem rather anti-correlated. Uh, and there are reasons that this could happen. Um, uh, Ryan Shannon has a pet theory, if anyone wants to ask him later. But uh, the, this is basically what the data has told us is, uh, is in it. This is the noise processes that it, we've been informed uh, are in this data by the data. Uh, and so that's really a lovely way to do it. We can get some really nice uh, inferences about data out. Um, and this is what we've basically found. We found that a lot of the pulsars uh, have complicated uh, noise processes in them, a lot of chromatic processes that are often ignored in other analyses. Um, of the 85 pulsars we have in this analysis, uh, 83 of them pass the checks of Gaussianity. And what that means is you, you take away all these noise processes and then you see uh, what's left over. And if the noise, if the residuals are Gaussian after that, you can feel quite confident that you've uh, sort of uh, modeled all the noise processes out of it. Um, two of them aren't, and if we're interested in that later, I've got some bonus slides. Uh, but it, it, what this really means is that uh, we have uh, we have a, a data set now that's appropriate to search for something like a common signal because we've reduced the risk of any noise misspecification. And this is just kind of an example of what I mean by a Gaussianity check to check that we've gotten everything right. When I take all the noise out of the data, I then weight and normalize the residuals and do this thing called an Anderson Darling statistic test. And basically just checking that the, what we have left over there um, has got a nice standard deviation, which is close to one. It's got very Gaussian sort of data points there. And what we're left with when we uh, take all of that out of the data and then also take out what we assume a gravitational wave background might look like in the data, uh, we have this pulsar down the bottom, which I think is the best example of it. It's just J2241 minus 5236. And when we do all that, we can get down to just the scatter of 30 nanoseconds. So we've got 30 nanoseconds of noise that we cannot account for. But that is absurdly low in comparison to the signal we expect to get, expect to try to find at least. And so that's why this is important. This is why it's so much fun. And this is where I want to sort of like deviate into talking about the pot of gold in the dumpster fire. There's a lot of stuff that we can find by looking at these astrophysical noise processes. And th this is a nice example of it, I think, at least. If we search for the chromatic processes, and when I say chromatic here, I mean frequency dependent processes in our uh, data set. What we can find is we can factorize these things together uh, in terms of the nominally measured uh, dispersion measure of each pulsar. And then we can start to see how these processes grow uh, with this nominal dispersion measure. The MPTA times a lot of pulsars, which have quite high dispersion measures. Um, but this is kind of the reason that we're able to do it. Because we do this detailed noise modeling and we're able to uh, get our leftover residuals down to such a low uh, root mean square uncertainty. And so if you look at the uh, plots on the right there, on the top I have the dispersion measure noise. And on the bottom I have the chromatic scattering noise. Um, and you can see the amplitude is just shifting. Uh, it's growing through the nominal dispersion measure that we measure. And the spectral index on the dispersion measure is right at the Colmar Grow spectrum, uh, where we expect the, the, the spectra to be uh, for a turbulent uh, ionized interstellar medium. Chromatic noise doesn't really seem to have this uh, dependence, but this is all, uh, the, really the first time at this large of a data set with millisecond pulsars we can start to look at this. And then similar to the PPTI, we can sort of also look at uh, what our solar wind distribution looks like. So this uh, brown line that I have here is what the sort of nominal solar wind value uh, in time, pulsar timing software is. It's four centimeters to uh, negative, negative three. Um, and so that's sort of the value that you tend to leave in your pulsar timing software and you don't really think about it too much, but then you can model it out. And a lot of people have been sort of becoming more concerned about this, myself included. Uh, and when we do, you can see that uh, when we factorize like bins of ecliptic latitude, the um, solar wind uh, mean density can go up to as high as uh, 10. It, it can be very, very different from that nominally assumed value. So there's a lot of astrophysical uh, sort of insights you can get from looking into the dumpster fire rather than dismissing it. And so I think that's really fun by itself. But 
doing this and doing this well lets us look at you know the name of the game, which is searches for common signals. So on the right here, I have just the uh, the state of uh, where the PTAs are at the moment, which is the joint analysis uh, shown by Paul Baker early, in an earlier session. Um, the credit to the IPTA GWA team. I'm not sure exactly who created the specific plot, um, but this is where we are at the moment. This is where uh, the different PTAs are looking for, and so we've also decided to look for this uh, for this common spectrum process, as that is what uh, the other PTAs found first uh, when they were looking through their data. And so we've done this in two ways. We've looked at a fixed spectral index of 4.33. And when we do that, we find a strong common spectrum process of about a negative 14.25. Um, and we find a log base factor of that of 9.68. So it's a significant result. Uh, what's being searched over when we do this is the fiduciary models that I've introduced here, but also achromatic red noise for all pulsars that don't already have it. And the reason I do that is because I don't want to accidentally uh, uh, introduce some threshold achromatic noise into a shared signal uh, where it wasn't strong enough to be selected for in the fiduciary no noise models. We've evolved this bit further and we've gone to the full PTA likelihood and we find a amplitude that is very consistent um, with the fixed uh, gamma version and a uh, constraint on the spectral index, which while rather broad because of a short time span, so we only have so many uh, significant frequency bins in our data, it is peaking exactly at uh, the 13 third signal that we expect uh, for a stochastic gravitational wave background. So this is you know, very, very exciting. It's a, a sort of a good introduction of this emerging pulsar timing array into the common signal world. Um, and where we sit in reference to the other pulsar timing arrays is this uh, not very uh, pretty or well done graphic, uh, which is me putting our three sigma posterior directly over um, the uh, plot by Paul Baker and the IPTA GWA team. So it is a bit broader, but it is consistent. Um, and it seems that it is marginally louder uh, in our data than it is in other pulse timing array data sets. However, that marginal loudness has now been seen in the Parks pulse timing array, uh, in the Chinese pulse timing array, and now in the MPTA. Uh, so it's not just, it's not something that's just uh, isolated to I feel like one PTA. It's now something that a lot of uh, different pulse timing arrays are observing, but it, doesn't have a great explanation at the moment. So it needs uh, to be investigated further. And it's a really interesting problem to begin to tackle. Uh, in terms of the spatially correlated signal, well, we haven't quite finished doing that yet, unfortunately. It's, uh, it takes a while. I, I really want to be finished doing it. But what we can do, uh, we can start to get excited about what this kind of means for our spatially correlated signal, what this means for the PTA world generally. Uh, and how we can do that is these predictions. So these are uh, sort of the back of the envelope predictions based on the Siemens et al. 2013 paper, uh, which references the scaling of the signal and noise uh, of the stochastic gravitational wave background. So this plot here, there's a lot of lines on it. Um, you don't need to worry too much about what they are, but I'll just quickly explain. The dashed lines are referenced uh, to the signal and noise to the order correlated signal, that common spectrum process that everyone's found uh, so far in the data set. And then the solid lines is uh, the signal and noise uh, to the uh, correlated uh, process. So the spatially correlated process, the hellings downs curve that everyone is trying to uh, really nail down. Um, the different colors reference different pulse timing arrays. And this one is a little bit uh, out of date. It doesn't take into account Chime entering Nanograv and uh, getting, the, getting that kind of data. And it also doesn't include um, the CPTA in it. But if we were to take prediction uh, at, the, at our year um, where we are now and just draw a line up uh, and we can start to look at the signal and noise ratio that we have to the gravitational wave background from the correlated signal. And that is a, at about a signal noise ratio of 13, which is a pretty significant result. Um, this is again, a very back of the hand calculation, but the thing to take away from this is that if what we're seeing at the moment is the autocorrelated signal of a stochastic gravitational wave background, we should be even more sensitive to a correlated signal. And so while the MPTA can accelerate the PDA community to this definitive detection, Really, we're able to start asking this question of not just what does it look like, but you know, where does it look different? We're introducing all these southern pulsars, which we can really make an impact with. And this is why, because soon we're going to be asking very different questions and the MPTA data set is going to be principal in the way that we do that. Um, so that's largely what I have for you today. I'll just leave you some conclusions of what's next to the, uh, the meerkat pulsar timing array. 
We have a few projects that are ongoing, uh, but expanding the search to spatial correlations is the real key, and the results for that will be coming soon. Anyway, thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, really exciting to see some of that Meerkat data. It's really beautiful to look at. Uh, so we just have just a little over a minute for questions. Uh, we do have one already. Um, question is, do you use Bayesian inference methods for selecting your noise model, or do you only look at the residuals and their whiteness? Does the latter protect you from overfitting? Uh, so we do both. So we actually, yeah, so we do a hierarchical Bayesian modeling. So we test every possible noise model and compare their evidences against each other. And so for that reason, we, we for, but by doing that, we can find the most probable uh, noise model that's applicable to the data, data set. But then following that, we then look at the residuals and test their whiteness and gaussianity so that we can, uh, yes, protect from overfitting, but also protect from uh, sub-threshold noise leaking through into our data set. Great, thank you. Um, and another question, is it possible to run the frequentist optimal statistic, which should be faster than a fully Bayesian search for correlations? Uh, it is definitely possible. Um, and we have been doing that to sort of diagnose our data set, but we're not at the point yet where we're uh, willing to release the results of, so the preliminary results we've done, we wanna be very conservative and sort of practical about what we've been doing, what we've been finding, yeah. Understandable. Um, and last one, one of the questions is asking to see the rewarding extra slide that you mentioned. Oh, right. Uh, so there's a few extra slides. It depends who's interested in what. Um, the ones that I was saying before was that we have two pulsars in uh, what I call the uh, MPTA graveyard. Uh, and that's uh, effectively because uh, when we were doing the noise analysis, we found that um, the noise properties are uh, being misattributed. Uh, and so they, the noise cannot quite be collected that well. For instance, this, so this is one of them, J1705 minus 1903. Uh, this is a Black Widow pulsar and it, it is eclipsed by its companion. And so what it has is it has orbital dispersive effects of its companion and that gets picked up as a solar wind, which it definitely is not. And so you get this, these really overwidened residuals, uh, which can really affect your data set in the end. Um, and then the other one that we have, uh, that we've decided to, stop uh, putting in a pulse timing ray um, is actually a possible mode changing millisecond pulsar. So uh, it has an, it had a huge uh, value of ECOR when we we're looking at it, which is accounting for jitter, but obviously ECOR has absorbed that mode changing behavior. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to time accurately because it's very difficult to account for when the mode changing is happening. There's actually been a paper written trying to re-account for this uh, based on sort of profile domain shapelet methods um, and that's uh, the Nathan et al. 2023 one I've just put down there. The other rewarding slides are about my uh, mortal fears about um, ECOR being actually secretly a red noise process. Uh, but if anyone's curious about that, if we, uh, we could go into that later. I don't know how much time we have, so. <laughs> yeah, I think we're unfortunately uh, at time. So we'll have to save that for another time. But uh, thank you so much again, Matt. Um, oh, Okay, so I think that concludes the rest of this session. We now have uh, about a eight and a half minute break until the next session starts, which will be led by uh, Carol uh, next up. So take a break, get some water, freshen up, uh, and we'll see you back in uh, eight minutes, uh, right on the hour. So welcome hey. back, everyone. We're right at the hour. I just wanted to introduce you, Carol, but you should go ahead and take it away. I just wanted to say, uh, so Luke will be handling Q&A for this session. Um, and otherwise, it's all in your hands. So if you're ready to go, I think we can go ahead and start. Thank you. Um, welcome to this uh, second session of our stochastic rotational wave background. Uh, we have an announcement about this session. Unfortunately, Darsan will not uh, present his talk today, and he apologized for it and wishes us a nice session. I'm reading his name in the meantime. And so we have only two talks for this hour, and we'll start with uh, Judy Comerford from the University of Colorado about the effect of observational inputs on the astrophysics uh, gleaned from the gravitational wave background. Uh, Julie, the stage is, you, is yours. You should be able to share your screen, I think. 
All right, well, I'll be talking today about how to use observations of galaxies and supermassive black holes to get the most accurate astrophysics that we can out of the new evidence that we have for a gravitational wave background. And throughout this talk, I'm going to be highlight, highlighting some of the work from my current group members, Joe Simon, who's a postdoc with us, as well as um, Maggie Huber, who's a grad student here, as well as one of my former students, um, Rebecca Nevin, I'll be showing some of the thesis work that she did here at CU. So this wonderful new evidence for a gravitational wave background has already been discussed quite a bit. So I'll just spend uh, a few words on it here to give some context to the rest of my talk. Um, so while it's not yet possible to definitively establish the origin of this um, signal, as we've heard in the previous talks, um, the signal is consistent with astrophysically motivated models of supermassive black hole binary populations. Um, and if this spectrum is produced by supermassive black hole binaries, then they seem to be higher mass and or merging more often than previously thought. Um, so that's an interesting thing to keep in mind um, as we go through the rest of the talk. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that we have a gravitational wave background produced by supermassive black hole binaries, and I'll talk about the astrophysics that we can get from that. So the inputs that we can use to get a gravitational wave background from merging binary black holes are, first of all, we need to know how often galaxies are merging. Um, so we need the galaxy merger rate, which will provide the initial number density of the uh, binary supermassive black holes. And then we need to populate those galaxy mergers with supermassive black holes at the centers and give them some appropriate mass distribution. That'll provide us with the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal from each binary. And then we need to know the amount of time it takes those black hole binaries to evolve down to separations where they will strongly emit gravitational waves that will be detectable by the pulsar timing arrays. So from these three pieces, we can get out the gravitational wave background. And now that we have evidence for a background, we finally have observational constraints on all of these pieces, except for the time scale for black hole binary evolution. And there has been a lot of work um, searching for black hole binaries, but so far there's no confident observational um, direct detection of a supermassive black hole binary separations less than a parsec. So that's why that orange square is kind of the last one that doesn't have any observational constraints. But we can use all the other pieces to then place some observational constraints on that binary evolution of the black holes. So there are different people in our group working on different facets of that problem, but our overarching goal is to pull it all together to make the most accurate observationally based measurements we can of the galaxy merger rate and the black hole mass function, combine that with this evidence for the gravitational wave background to back out the most accurate observational constraints that we can on black hole binary evolution. So that's our goal. And I'm gonna talk about the galaxy merger rate and the black hole mass function. Uh, and I'll start out by talking about the galaxy merger rate. So there's plenty of different ways you can calculate a galaxy merger rate. Um, I'm going to be discussing galaxy pairs first. Um, then I'll talk about uh, another way you could get a galaxy merger rate a little bit later on. Um, so this project to measure the galaxy merger rate using um, galaxy close pairs is being led by Joe Simon. Um, he found uh, a sample of galaxy pairs in Sloan. We're using Sloan because we need those spectroscopic redshifts to get the velocity offsets between the, the two galaxies in a pair. So we're defining galaxy close pairs as those with projected separations of half a kiloparsec up to 30 kiloparsec and with velocity offsets less than 500 kilometers per second. And we chose those ranges for direct comparison with previous close pair samples. Um, but we're also looking at how the merger rate calculation can change when we vary those assumptions on projected separation and velocity separation, because ultimately we want to calculate a galaxy merger rate that would marginalize over those assumptions. Um, but for now, we're using those cutoffs of 30 kiloparsecs and 500 kilometers per second. So that's our observable input to the galaxy merger rate. Then uh, you also need to know how many of these galaxy pairs are also, also actually going to merge 
because just because you have a pair of galaxies close together in the sky doesn't necessarily mean that they end up merging. They could just have a flyby. So we need to apply a correction factor for that. And we also need to put in uh, an observability time scale for the merger. And since we can't get those two numbers from the observations, um, we use simulations to estimate what that correction factor and observability time scales are. Now, if you're thinking, haven't Sloan galaxy pairs already been well studied? Uh, why are we doing this again? Yes, there have been lots of papers and studies about Sloan galaxy pairs, and there is a galaxy merger rate calculation using Sloan galaxy pairs, but it's been more than 10 years since that calculation. So we figured it was time to do it again with some updates, particularly in light of these new gravitational wave background evidence. Um, we want to have the most accurate up-to-date galaxy merger rate we can to get the most out of that um, gravitational wave signature. So to highlight a couple of the updates we've made to the merger rate calculation, um, we've updated calculations of the correction factor and the observability time scale. So whereas previous studies used one number for the correction factor that they got from um, gadget merger simulations of disk galaxies, um, we have updated the correction uh, factor to be instead of one number, a function of the separation of the pair on the sky, the velocity offset of the pair on the sky, the redshift, and the galaxy host mass. Um, and we've calculated this correction using the illustrious simulations where we have mergers from uh, galaxies with a wide range of morphologies that are more representative of the actual um, cosmological population of galaxies. So that's one update. The other update we did was to that um, observ ob observability time scale. So instead of using a single number for that, as was done in the past um, from the Millennium simulation, and Millennium was a dark matter only simulation, the stars and black holes were added in post-processing. So from Millennium, you can get a dark matter halo merger rate, but there's not a direct translation of that into a galaxy merger rate because there's no simple way to connect dark matter halos and observed galaxies. So instead, we do this calculation as a function, again, of the pair separation, velocity offset, redshift, and galaxy mass, um, and this time using illustrious, where we have self-consistent models then of the dark matter and the baryons. So that was another update. And a couple other things we did was to directly calculate the small angle incompleteness of Sloan instead of using an approximation, and also to incorporate galaxy mass uncertainties for the first time. So as a result of these updates, we use the Sloan uh, sample of close pairs of galaxies to derive a galaxy merger rate that is a factor of two larger than what previous studies had found using um, similar samples of Sloan galaxy um, close pairs. And so a factor of two difference in the merger rate would then translate to a square root of two increase in the gravitational wave background amplitude. So something like this, a larger galaxy merger rate could help explain some of that stronger gravitational wave um, signal that the pulsar tiny rays seem to be finding. Okay, so this is our, our results on the galaxy merger rate from galaxy pairs. I wanted to mention another way of finding galaxy mergers as a test of whether we would get different results using a different way of finding galaxies. So instead of just looking for pairs of galaxies on the sky, you can go straight into the cosmological simulations and look at what merging galaxies and non-merging galaxies look like and use that to help understand how to find galaxy mergers in your data. And so an advantage of the simulations is that you have you know the stages of the merger. You can see early stage mergers, late stage post-coalescence. You know how long the merger spends at each of these different stages. You know the mass ratio, you know the gas fraction of the merger. You have all this information, you can get the time scale. And so um, this, is, this is, was my student Rebecca Nevin's thesis was to use simulations as a basis for then going in and looking for galaxy mergers in the Sloan 4 manga survey. And so the interesting thing about manga is that it's an integral field spectroscopic survey. So instead of just having a single fiber spectrum that gives you like one redshift for the galaxy, you have 
fibers across the entire face of the galaxy in this hexagonal footprint. And so you can get kinematic information about the stars and the gas across the entire face of the galaxy. And so in recent years, we have advents of the first large samples of galaxies that have been observed with integral field spectroscopy. So we've been able to do this um, for the first time just in recent years. So Manga is a sample of 10,000 galaxies at relatively low redshift, um, redshift 0.01 to 0.15, with a median redshift of 0.03. And it's the largest um, galactic sample uh, that has been observed with integral field um, spectroscopy. So um, what Rebecca did was take simulations of galaxy mergers, um, take that simulated data and turn it into what it would look like if it was observed by Manga. So on the left here, you see figures of what the R-band images would look like of the simulated mergers. And there's timestamps there of different snapshots of the merger. And then that hexagonal footprint shows you where the Manga observations would be. And so we can derive spectra across the entire face of that hexagon, and we can make velocity maps, uh, dispersion maps. And so I'm just showing an example of the stellar velocity maps here on the right-hand panel, where you can see red shifts and blue shifts in the, in the stars in the galaxy. You can see evidence for rotation there. And then you can also see how the, the, di the dynamics of the stars get disturbed during different phases of this merger. So the novel thing here is using kinematics for the first time in a large survey to help better identify mergers. So we are using the imaging data as well as the kinematics to try to understand the relative importance of imaging parameters versus kinematics in identifying mergers. And what Rebecca found is that the kinematics are the most useful for finding the late stage galaxy mergers. So for example, the galaxy, galaxy pairs would not find those late stage mergers where the bulges have already coalesced, but the kinematic signatures in the stars stay imprinted in the manga data for longer than the imaging um, signatures um, stay imprinted. So the kinematics can help you find, kind of build a more complete sample of mergers across many different, many different stages. But the limitation of manga is that it's a relatively small sample. It's at low redshifts. And the kinematics, um, the kinematics are helpful, but if, if you had to pick one or the other, we find that there's more information you can get about mergers from the imaging than from the kinematics. And so I think for a study like this, where we're relating the mergers then to the gravitational wave background, I think we're better off with a pair study or some other imaging-based study than with this kinematics, um, imaging and kinematics study that's restricted just to this manga sample. So in order to understand um, the cosmological population of merging black holes that you would get from these galaxy mergers, then the next step here is to look at the supermassive black hole mass function. And so uh, it's been argued that the greatest source of uncertainty in calculating the gravitational wave background here is the supermassive black hole masses. Like it's, it's hard enough to, to get the galaxy mergers, but then it's even harder to get uh, accurate observationally based estimates of supermassive black hole masses. So that's the next thing that we are working on. And the biases in the black hole masses that you get can have a huge effect on the inferred gravitational wave background. Um, biases can uh, have an effect of up to a factor of three or more on the gravitational wave background, just biases on the black hole masses. So that kind of underscores the importance in thinking carefully about how we do our, our black hole masses. So there are several different ways you can get supermassive black hole masses. Um, one popular one is the M-sigma relationship. Um, this one is limited just because of the lack of large, deep enough spectroscopic surveys of galaxies that give you the spectra you need to get that velocity dispersion. So instead, many frameworks use the M and bulge relation because that can be based entirely on photometric data uh, without needing any spectra. And so um, a lot of studies use M and bulge, but M and bulge gets more difficult at redshifts beyond about 0.2. Um, because in order to get the bulge mass, you need to do a bulge disk decomposition on your galaxy. That's good. That becomes more difficult at larger redshifts. Um, you also need to know the bulge to total ratio as a function of galaxy type. That becomes uncertain. Um, so there are lots of uncertainties that come out of the MM bulge relationship. 
So another thing that people have been exploring is instead of um, getting sigma in M sigma from spectroscopy, maybe we can infer that velocity dispersion from purely photometric properties. So it turns out if you have the galaxy mass, the effective radius and the Sursic index, which are all things you can get just from the photometry, you can get a pretty good approximation of the velocity dispersion. So this plot on the bottom right shows the measured velocity dispersion from spectra against the inferred velocity dispersion from photometry for Sloan galaxies. And you can see that it looks like there's something promising there um, with this inferred uh, sigma. And then using the inferred sigma, you can then um, get an inferred supermassive black hole mass and go forward that way using large photometric surveys of galaxies. So this is something that Joe has been working on as well. And he's found that when you use these inferred sigmas to get black hole masses, you end up with more massive black hole binary systems than previous models have found. And so that's another thing that could help explain this enhanced amplitude of the gravitational wave um, background evidence that we're seeing. So there are many different ways of getting the supermassive black hole mass. They each have their own biases and uncertainties. And so our graduate student, Maggie Huber, is working on quantifying those different uncertainties and biases so we can better understand the limitations of the black hole masses that we're putting into this framework. Um, so there are definitely biases as a, as a function of the morphology of your galaxy, your stellar mass. If you have an AGN, that could be contributing some light to the bulge. So when you calculate you know, the bulge mass based on the light, there may be some you know, AGN contribution there that you have to worry about. And so we're trying to kind of untangle all these effects and better understand the biases in things like M sigma, M M bulge, um, and then other ways of getting black hole masses. For example, if you have a broadline AGN, you can use the broadlines to get a black hole mass. We're comparing all these things to try to understand and quantify the biases better to go into um, the framework. So to bring it all together, we are well on our way with the constraining the observational inputs here. Uh, we're working on getting the best galaxy merger rate that we can get using observations. We're trying to quantify all the uncertainties and get the best black hole masses we can get. And then, you know, as the years go on, uh, the gravitational wave background evidence will only become stronger and stronger so that then we can put those three observationally or empirically based things together to get constraints on the black hole binary evolution time scale. And once you have that, then you can start learning things about the physics of black hole binary evolution, including the effects of you know, the three big hardening mechanisms, uh, stellar loss cone scattering when a binary intersects the orbit of a star, um, drag as a binary moves through gas in a circumbinary disk, uh, the effect of differential accretion. That's ultimately kind of the physics we want to get to uh, from these constraining the observations as best as we can to kind of nail down the observational constraints on that physics of the binaries as best as we can. Okay, I'll leave it there and um, take any questions. Thank you. Many thanks to the awesome presentation. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions in uh, the Q and A section? Yeah, so please enter any questions into the Q and A section. Uh, I did have a bunch. Maybe I'll restrict to just <laughs> one or two. Um, I was curious in kind of the first section of results where uh, the updated merger rates are found to be about a factor of two higher. Do you know offhand if that comes more from that um, the pre-factor or from the merger time changes? Oh, from the, let's see, the correction factor or the observability time scales. Let me pull that. Or I guess there were also some changes to the, just the, the pair fraction itself. So yeah, the so pair overall, fraction, where does the two, yeah. Yeah, we also just did the pair fraction from scratch as well. So we just kind of did everything from scratch. So the pair fraction ended up being, you know, pretty similar to what other people have done. And we tried to match their criteria so we could do a one-to-one -one comparison with like the lots and all result. Um, and so the uh, the observability time scale was the the main difference, just having that update from the Millennium simulation to Lustrous was such a big um, leap that that was where um, Joe, this is um, Joe Simon's work, saw the, saw the biggest change there. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I'm super interested in these uh, manga based results. Also, uh, you were saying that using the kind of larger field SDSS results are probably still better for doing modeling. But does the manga data, does that uh, allow you to inform incompleteness estimates better? So like, can you use those manga results to update the SDSS estimates? Yeah, so the yeah, the benefit, this was we wanted to test this because we had no idea. Like people, people don't use kinematics to identify mergers because there haven't been the sample. So we just said, you know, would kinematics be like a huge boon in this field? And it turned out like not, not, not so much. The imaging is still more important. But yes, the image, the kinematics do let you kind of trace more of the merger from the early stages to the post-coalescence where you lose the imaging signature, especially in SDSS data, but there's still some kinematics that, resain, that remain. And so the observability timescales are different for these manga observations. And, and the great thing about having, having it being based on the simulations is that you know exactly how long after the merger you're still seeing these, these kinematic effects. And so, but I wouldn't use those same observability timescales then with the pair fraction because they're kind of testing testing different things. With the pairs, we know we're only doing the pre-coalescence. And so it's the time scale there. And then you just kind of like assume the black holes merge and, and, and leave it at that. So you have to do different observability um, timescales depending on how you are finding your galaxy mergers in the first place. Um, thank you. That's all. Then many, many thanks, uh, Julie, for your wonderful talk. Um, now we have uh, Si Yuan uh, from Beijing. We'll talk about the results from the second gravitational wave with the EPTA TR2 plus ENPTA TR1. Okay. Um, can people see my screen and hear me? Um... Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um... Thanks for the organizer for giving me the slot to talk about uh, the EPTA and MPTA results. Um, this is, um, uh, is part of the uh, of the many results that were published, um, I think, two weeks or so ago. Um, and um, yeah, just one quick summary on PTAs. Um, we look for gravitational waves. We look in the in the nanohertz region, uh, and um, in in that region, we hope to find um, gravitational waves. As um, Julie just mentioned, um, hopefully they come from supermassive local binaries. And the uh, uh, criteria, key criteria that we uh, look for is this Hansen Downs curve, which is a uh, angular separation uh, and the expected correlation amount of, uh, of a common signal across different um, different parts of pairs. Um, yeah. And I, I think there were many talks introduced in PTA, so we must spend too much time on this. Um, uh, and just uh, I'll say this talk is given um, on behalf of the EPTA and MPTA collaborations. And there were a lot of people involved in all this work. Here's just a list of names. Um, and I'll just talk about the gravitational background um, search and a little bit of the continuous wave uh, single source search as well. In EPTA and MPTA, we use um, four data sets just to um, try to uh, um, make it a bit simpler to understand. Uh, the top, um, top row is um, EPTA only data. So what we call the DR2 full is the, just the full data set with all the systems and um, all the time span. The DR2 new is the EPTA data only and, and that, that uses only the newer systems uh, and has only 10 years or so of time span, which are just the, uh, the most recent 10 years with the um, newest uh, observing systems. And then the second row, uh, giving the plus notation to the, uh, to the, um, to the data sets, it's just the data set above, um, including uh, adding the MPTA data. So um, uh, the MPTA data is about three years long, and um, there's um, I think two two and a half year of overlap. So if you add those to the EPTA data, there's a little bit of uh, uh, of more data. Uh, and yeah, the archive links that I put down here is um, just um, uh, the the three main ones um, used for this work. Um, right, so the first step is to look for something that's common, and, uh, and so we did, um, we analyzed, um, oh, now I just focus on the, the APTA data alone. So um, in blue will always be the full data set of APTA, and in orange will be just the um, data of, of, the, uh, of the newer backend systems. 
And so first of all, we search for a, a common signal and um, and on the left, you see the free, the, um, the per frequency uh, um, amount of power that we find. Um, and uh, you can see that there's a, as you go to low frequency, you see that there's um, more power appearing and this um, can be fitted with some kind of power law model. And this gives you the figure on the right where you have the spectral index and the amplitude of the power law. Uh, and you see that um, you know, the, the two data sets um, give um, different uh, sort of different posteriors in the power law. Although there's like a, you know, the orange one is um, has a long tail which covers the um, uh, the region of the full data set. So um, there's some sort of agreement and some uh, some uh, some difference between the two. However, at um, you know, the expected 13 thirds of, uh, um, of circular binaries uh, emitting quantization wave, this, um, this background gives you, uh, you know, the two data sets is uh, roughly consistent and give like a, um, uh, a nominal value of 2.5, 10 to minus 15 at one over one year as a medium value. Okay, so, this, so this is the, the second step and is to see what type of correlation has, does this common signal have? Right? And so, uh, and so we search for um, and the correlation at the same time as we search for power law in a in a base in a combined base analysis. And uh, on the left, you see the um, the, the different um, amount of correlation uh, bin in ten bins, each of which has uh, has thirteen uh, parts of pairs. And um, just to, and, and you can see, um, you know, the they, the uncertainties are very broad. However, the blue is um is, uh, less consistent than announced, uh, mainly because of the like say this two uh two um bins here in the around 60 and 80 uh, degree angle separations are, are, are quite um different from the expected value of the Hamilton nouns, whereas the orange one they fit um fit the Hamilton nouns curve better. Uh and uh yeah, as before, the power law recovery is about is very similar as before. We can do the same analysis in the optimal statistics. So um, this is a frequentist, semi-frequentist um, way to compare against the Bayesian results. And so the left shows you the, um, the optimal statistic uh, recovered uh, spatial correlations, which are very similar to the Bayesian ones. Um, yeah, although the, you know, the first um, bin has some sort of sort of different. But again, the, the orange ones with the uh, newer systems, they follow things down a bit better, whereas the blue ones, um, they follow it a bit less, especially again, these two uh, angular separations on 60 and 80, they are quite offset from the expected value of things now. And these are translate into a uh, signal to noise um, in, in a frequentist way. And um, here the, the solid lines are the dr 2 new and the dashed lines are the dr 2 full. Uh, mainly I just want to point out that all of these, um, whatever uh, special relations you assume and for different data sets, most of them are consistent with zero. So uh, so there's no evidence for any of these in any data set. Uh, the only one that is uh, a little bit offset from different uh, from zero is the uh, dr 2 new, which has sort of a mean, Median is an average of 3.5. Uh, these are the noise marginalized optimal statistics. So that's why you have a, uh, you have a distribution of signal to noise um, values uh, since you just sample over the, um, the pulsar red noise and, and, and the M values. Um, yeah. And uh, um, an equivalent to these signal to noise ratios um, is the Bayesian, um, Bayesian model comparison base factors. Uh, this is a full table that we have in the paper, uh, but um, again, just the, the the main gist for the dr two full and the dr two full plus, um, all the sort of base factors are around one, mainly more or less, and so there's no evidence for any um, any type of base factors, and we do all of these in comparison to the um, base model, which is partial noise plus common uncorrelated red noise, uh, CURN. Uh, HD stands for Hamilton nouns, MP is monopole, and DP is dipole. So we tested um, different um, different types of correlations and uh, and uh, and also um, uh, like um, models with two uh, correlations. Uh, and then in the other new, um, you see that again most of the 
uh, the the correlations um, involved are uh, uh, giving a phase structures of about one, and then uh, those that have the Hamilton nouns are more favored. The ones that have uh, two sort of Hamilton nouns and an additional comb process are sort of uh, not as favored as the one that has only Hamilton nouns. So if you have uh, compared the Hamilton nouns uh, against the current, we have the base of about 60 or so. And then if you add an additional uh, correlative process, uh, you get you know, base structures that are about 30 or so. So um, the, uh, the, the base structures drop. Um, Drop there, uh, yeah. And this is um, no, this is a somewhat consistent that um, the only sort of um, significant evidence I would have is uh, is for having nouns in the yeah, two new data set. Okay, now we have a, a signal. We have some some hint of uh, of it being having sounds correlated. The next step is to check what how um, how significant this um this uh the signal is. Uh, and so we did that in two methods. Um. One is facious, as we're going to talk about now, and then the other one is uh, sky scrambling. Both of those are basically aimed at um, at, uh, at providing a proxy to give us p values. So we um, uh, we 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 cannot e repeat the experiment um, with PTAs uh, many many times to get you know uh, uh, without with no signal in it to see what sort of the underlying null distribution is, and so um, and so uh, we need some kind of proxy. And uh, with skyscrapers, I don't know, with phase shifts and skyscrapers, um, we, we try to do that. Uh, phase shift is essentially um, adding some kind of random shifts in the uh, in, in the in the Fourier um, Fourier representation of the uh, of the of the data set, and so that in principle should destroy any correlated signal uh, as a gravitational background um, correlates in, in time. And so if you shift things a little bit in time. Uh, that uh, correlation should be um, should uh, go away. However, um, you keep all the the process in you know, the data as they are, so you, you should still have the, the sort of red noise and DM of of, uh, of a given parser. And so we did the phase shifts in in the, uh, for a data set. The left is are the base factors one, and the right is the signal to noise and nouns. What is plotted here is the one minus commutative density function. And this um, allows you just to basically read off uh, at the given well, base log ten base factors that you've detected. Uh, you can read off the p-value as the on the y-axis. Um, yeah, for the dear to new, we get something like a 0.04, which is you know, uh, it's for it's not a significant uh, um, significant measurement. Whereas for the dear to new, we have um, uh, something of like one. Uh, uh, one uh, phase shift uh, of about two thousand random ones uh, produced um, a single uh, a base factor as large as um uh, as what we found in the data set. So that gives you like a p value of point um, uh, one in two thousand. Uh, and for the uh, for the signal to noise of the um, hence nouns, um, we do the same. And uh, and so for the full, we get something like point oh seven, which is uh also not very significant however for the um for the operations phases we did not find any uh any uh signal to noise that's larger than what we measured in the data new um for about ten thousand phases uh and so we only put an upper limit of like one in le less than in one in ten thousand uh now in the sky scrambling um so on the on the on the left you see the real data and we uh, we um, did that uh, with a mesh threshold of less than 0.1 for all skyscrapers. There's no noise mating, um, and uh, you get the, the the distribution on the left. Here now you see that uh, um, the full and the new start to be different, especially at high signal to noise ratio. And, and this is uh, some probably some indication that uh, the skyscrambling is not uh, at least as it performed there is not. Um, uh, not sufficient to destroy all correlation signal if there was one, um, and you get a big p values that are, that are in, the, in in the legends here. Uh, so we did um, some more tests on that and, and use a simulated yeah, to new like data set to do that to do the testing, and on the right there's uh, many different curves. Um, 
The SIA one is simulated data set, so it's a simulation that we um, made uh, without any uh, any Cartesian signal. And so um, that, um, in theory, should produce a, a p-value that um, that we should that should be representative of the data set. Uh, the GX2, so the generalized chi-square distribution, is a, it's a theoretical um, computation or from a data set. Uh, what you would expect as a as a as the um, null distribution, and uh, and then the uh, orange and green are the same sky stream and phase shift method as on as on the left, and you see at the detected value of the of the gear to new about three point five, you have a spread of different p values, uh, about a factor of um, a few or so different, and, and so this uh, just you know, tells us that we need a, a bit. To be careful with uh, interpreting this p values as, you know, as um, however many sigma detection you get, and we need to you know um, investigate more in detail, like what uh, what sort of a, a good method is um, to give us an estimation of significance. Um, yeah, and so um, there there is probably a question of like what's the difference between um, what's different between the to full and the to new because the results seem to be you know, um, different and, and not consistent. And so here's um, some uh, ideas that we have, and we need to uh, spend time to sort of um, work on each of, each of these and, and see, you know, what, um, how, we, or whether we can pin down the difference. Uh, one is the uh, lower quality of their data. Um, those were they taking, you know, the 1990s and, and early 2000s. So uh, there was a lack of radio frequency coverage, lack of polarization calibration, and um, in general speaking, the instrumentation was um, uh, was not as sensitive, and so maybe um, maybe the quality of data was just not good enough. Uh, there's improper ways of power of the power fitting. Uh, basically, um, we with PTAs, we uh, not all pulsars have the same time span. There's um there's pulsars that um have just been recently found and were added to the PTAs, and there are pulsars that have been timed for a very long time because they were so the first pulsars, uh, and so um. And so those a very long time pulsars they dominate the lowest frequencies, and because there are only a few of those, um, they can be sort of uh, uh, you know, um, if there are not, if there's some issues with those, they they sort of um, give you like a they dominate sort of the lowest frequency and can give you some um, uh, different uh, different recoveries of the power law. Uh, and then there could be excess noise either the low frequencies. Um, as I said, from the you know, from the longest time pulsars, for example, or the high frequencies. Um, if, they, if we if we don't model well, uh, some uh, short term effects um, in the data set uh, that can also skew skew your power law in in, uh, in, in some sense. And finally, um, uh, the the signal that um, we mentioned could be actually be not well the 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 Cartesian signal or pulsar noise signals could actually be non stationary, and so what we actually Measure in you know, in the early data set in, in the recent data set can just be different because the signal is non stationary. Um, adding the yeah adding the MPT data set will give you broadly consistent results, as are shown here. Uh, just on, it's a bit complicated, but just on the right uh, we can see the power law contours. If you compare the red and orange, which is the new which is the uh, the new data set, they are very similar. And if you compare the green and blue, they're also very similar. And uh, a similar story you can see on the left with the um, uh, with the uh, frequency dependent power distribution of, um, of the common signal. Um, we also use this um, this uh, tension meter uh, difference distribution figures to to visualize the difference between the, um, uh, the different uh, data sets that we use and analyze. Uh, and so the way to interpret this is, is the the um, they're basically giving you a difference um, in in some sigma level between the different data sets that you here compare. Uh, the the furthest out is two sigma level. The uh, uh, the in, the the inner sort of contour is one sigma, and then the small darkest blue circle is the is the actual measured value um, between the of the difference. So in in that sense, for the to four, the difference. Between the, the the those two about well, 0 0.03 sigma also, which is uh, very small, and then in the dr two new and dr two new plus the sigma the the, the difference is about 0.1 sigma, 
Yeah, so that's a, a little bit more measurable, but it is still very small and consistent. Uh, and um, yeah, and so we, we also look at a little bit of continuous waves. So um, a single gravitation wave source emitting uh, a continuous gravitation wave in, in a sense. Uh, and uh, so we look at the get to mu alone because it uh, shows some evidence for his nouns. Uh, and we search for a, uh, a single wave voltage wave signal. And um, if you look at Bayesian analysis, you can find some sort of signal right, uh, in, in quotation marks at a certain frequency and with a, a certain gravitational wave strain value. The different colors here just indicate different samplers and different um, uh, different settings. I think one is roof and one is without Earth term. Uh, and so you see they're you know, they, they're all consistent and converge some um, some signal some possible continuous wave signal. Uh, if you look on the left, you have a, um, a frequentist way, which computes the two uh, the the FE statistic, uh, and plots is just the two times of that. Uh, and uh, the the blue the, the blue you see what um, comes out from data set, the distribution um, around the, the mean value of about twenty or so. And if you compare that to the expected value from from sort of a, a no continuous wave signal, which is the uh, black uh, chi square distribution, um, so it's sort of slightly different, right? It's, um, it's more significant for the measure. Um, yeah. However, if you look at the sky position, um, it's very uncertain, especially in the if the um, using the FE statistic, uh, you see that. You know, there's vast patches of sky where the source could be, including Virgo pits and this Fornax. And then there's uh, um, this region here around this black parser, um, which you know could be indication that something may be coming from this one parser. Uh, and we'll have to investigate more. And um, can can also check more in, in the uh, single organization of search um, paper that is, uh, is on the archive, which is uh, just the second one here. Just uh, a summary. Sorry, I don't know the time. If I'm over time, I can stop and receive my summary. Yeah, I think that would be great to leave a little room for questions. Yeah. Many thanks, uh, see you on a very nice presentation. I had a question. Uh, I think it was on slide seven when uh, you compared the uh, yes, yeah, so a correlation coefficient between the two data sets. If I understood well, but I'm, uh, I'm not an expert on the analysis of the stochastic background with the zipper source. Uh, I'm more on these detectors. So here, I was thinking that you would have an overlap between the data between the R2 full and the R2 new because uh, the R2 full includes. Uh, so they eat out the R2 new rates. Yes. Do you know why you don't have, I mean, at least an overlap with the, be, be, for few values? Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so we don't know. Um, uh, we don't know why they're different. Um, as you mentioned, we would expect that you know, the R2 full would be giving you a bigger error bus and then, and then the R2, well, no, the other way. So we would expect that the R2 new gives you some error bars, and the R2 new should, the R2 full should give you uh, consistent ones, but smaller, right? Because there's more data. Um, however, we don't see that, and um, and so we, we can just um, so that there's some just some ideas that we have that why the data could be different, and um, uh, and, and we have to investigate uh, in, in more detail. Uh, the main, I think, the main thing that we expect thing is that maybe the um the dia to full which adds a very long sort of uh, uh early uh legacy data that um that is mainly just a single radio frequency and um and so we cannot measure the special measure variation very well and um and uh there could be some other types of sort of uh, noise that were added in the data set in, in the early data set and so um so that could sort of contaminate um what, what you see uh, but um, yeah, yeah, but that's all um things that we have to we have to check more carefully uh, in this ongoing work. Okay, okay, thank you. 
So I think we have time for uh, one more question, which we have from the Q&A, uh, and that's, do any of the other PTAs see this single gravitational wave signal? signal? Uh, is it at the same frequency? Yeah, so I, I think um, the only other one that um, that was analyzed was the number of uh, 15 years for, uh, for a single gravitational wave source. And I think they uh, they see something there as well. Um, this is a, it should be the same frequency. Uh, however, the um, the significant um, and yeah, maybe we can uh, thank all of the speakers for uh, a large number of really excellent talks uh, and all of the uh, attendees for for joining and uh, great questions throughout. So thanks so much, everybody, and also to and, Carol for uh, yeah. helping to organize thanks, and to. Everyone. And, and thank thanks you. to you, Luke. Yeah, sure. we appreciate and it. Yeah. Thanks to you, Luke, for your help also. Sure. Luke. And to you too, thankful for keeping everything running. <laughs> Not doing much over here, but that's okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> just thank you to everyone. We will start back at 7 UTC, I believe, which is in about six hours. So uh, get some sleep or enjoy your day or do whatever you're about to do. And thank you all for joining. Bye, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Bye.